would like to thank uh, Professor Magdalena and uh, Professor Francesco Mio and you to um, uh, letting me to let me uh, join this group and uh, give me the opportunity to uh, tell you what uh, my research is all about. I am a tenured uh, Roman law uh, research fellow at the law faculty of Università Cattolica di Milano in Italy. I hold tutorials and seminars in, in Milan. And since 2017, I have been a temporary lecturer of a course of Roman law hold in English um, and concerning um, Roman law and common law, like two uh, jurisprudential traditions in comparison at international curriculum that is a, a branch of my university uh, that offers um, semesters for foreign students who would like to have a semester of university of, or college uh, in Italy. And since uh, 2000, 2018, I have been a temporary lecturer of a course of Roman law institutes um, at the Faculty of Law and Economics of Università Cattolica uh, de Sacro Cuore uh, di Piacenza, that is another uh, campus of my uh, university. Uh, let's say that the uh, research that I am carrying out um, at the moment and that I started some months ago um, is a sort of natural continuation and completion of the uh, research I have just finished, even if there is a, a, always something to learn. Um, you never stop uh, um, discovering things uh, about researches, even if you have uh, put an end to, to them. That research uh, had uh, merged into a monograph and uh, it was about legacies concerning um, lana, linum, versicoloria and purpura. Uh, versicoloria um, is a technical term that I found just in the uh, text of the jurist uh, that um, refers to uh, colored uh, yarns. But um, by saying that, I'm referring to a single color, not multicolor, like versicoloria normally means in other texts in the Roman literature. <clears throat> and uh, this first research um, was carried out by um, reading uh, the um, Latin literature sources, and of course, by constantly, constantly reading the works of the archaeologists and the antiquity scholars in order to better understand the um, legal problems um, connected with the cases uh, the problematic cases um, examined and solved by uh, the juries. So this way I have learned that, uh, first of all, jurists were, Rom I'm, I'm referring to Roman jurists, um, so I'm referring to a period that goes from the end of the first century before Christ until the um, uh, first half of the third century um, after Christ, um, I was saying that the, the Roman jurists were really aware of 
almost everything. I mean, they had a technical knowledge of everything. Probably they were helped by other uh, experts, but anyway, they uh, show how um, they know uh, all the tech technical problems uh, linked to uh, juridical problems. So these texts that I have studied uh, needed to be um, read and understood with the help of the, uh, again, um, works of the antiquity scholars and uh, with the uh, results um, obtained by archaeologists and um, with the examination of the um, remains that archaeologists themselves uh, have uh, discovered in the last uh, years. So it was really a um, profound in interdisciplinary work that also um, showed me um, how uh, juristic uh, texts and writings um, could confirm a lot of theories uh, elaborated by histori historians, by antiquity scholars and uh, archaeologists. So I really could see a lot of links between uh, what uh, archaeologists and uh, historians have hypothesized and what I have um, discovered through the analysis of the um, juristic writings. So um, let's say that this first research um, was relating to legacies of textiles fibers like lana, linum, versicoloria, and purpura, but um, let's say uh, in from the raw material up to uh, the beginning of the weaving, and, and that's it. So the, the research I would like to talk to you about today is a sort of continuation and a completion of the um, mentioned uh, research um, concerning um, raw or processed uh, textile fibers up to the weaving of lana, linum, versicoloria and purpura. Uh, what, it, what it is important to point out is that these kind of legacies are kept uh, distinct um, by Roman Jews from those of vestis or vestimenta uh, concerning fully uh, woven canvases, entire wardrobes, um, or single items of uh, clothing. So this research is based on the study of sources concerning the object and the interpretation of the legacies and the trust of clothing. Um, of course, um, as like in the other uh, study, uh, this research um, has raised the need to contextualize uh, the legal arguments uh, uh, present in the juristic writings. Um, for this purpose, I have uh, taken into consideration the conclusion drawn in the previous study uh, on the level of the historical, social, and economic study of the ancient textile chain system. Uh, furthermore, the, since the notion of vestis emerging from the juristic writings not only refers to a simple, completely woven piece of cloth, 
but also and above all to a finished product consisting of a dress ready to be worn. During the investigation, I have started to study the methods of making the garments in Roman antiquity, and in particular as uh, on an on a artisan level. Um, <clears throat> and of course, since sometimes the precise identification of the different types of clothing indicated in the law cases considered by the jurists in their works proves to be indispensable for the understanding of the underlying legal problems, um, I have started to consult the sources of Latin literature and examine the results of the antiquity uh, studies on the most popular forms of clothing in Roman times and the reports of the archaeologists on, on the, um, the related iconographic and physical evidence. And with physical evidence, I mean the fragments of uh, cloth that has been discovered. Um, in uh, Justinian's digest, uh, there is a huge number of um, legacies, that means gifts out of the inheritance um, concerning clothing, and most of them um, are destined uh, to uh, the matres familias, that is the spouses of the testators. Um, and normally uh, these garments were garments that in life, during life, these women used to uh, wear because uh, their husbands ha had given them to, uh, have given them to them. Uh, but um, in most cases, uh, according to Roman law, these matres familias weren't the uh, owner of those garments because they were alieni iuris. It means that they were under the, uh, the manus, that is the power of their um, husband. Um, so they couldn't be um, the uh, owner of things and they couldn't um, conclude contracts and so on. So at the end of the life of, um, of a testator who normally loved uh, his wife, um, the testator himself was worried uh, about the um, wife uh, to have and to keep all she used to wear during his life. Uh, so that's why there are so many uh, texts concerning uh, cases, problematic cases, about the interpretation of these uh, provisions. But first of all, I have to uh, tell you that according to uh, Roman uh, jurists, uh, the notion of vestis uh, or vestimenta was really wide because as you can see in this text um, taken from the digest uh, book uh, 34, um, title two, fragment tw uh, 22, Alpian, uh, was a jurist uh, who worked uh, and, and lived and lived during the first half of the third century uh, after Christ. So we can say that he was one of the last um, huge and most important voices of classical law. According to Alpian, um, vestimentum, and I read directly the translation that I made of the passage in Latin, is what one has finished uh, weaving and 
it's important to uh, underline the term, the terms used in Latin, id quod detextum est, which occurs when uh, the weaving is entirely completed. Id est si sit consumatum. Although the piece of cloth has not been detached from uh, the loom, et si desectum non sit. Um, therefore, Alpion specifies that what is on the loom and has not yet been completed, non dum per, per textum, vel de textum, is defined as contextum, that is in the, in the process of being formed. And the allusion is to the warp and the weft, stamen and subtamen uh, used during weaving. So at the end of the day, we can say we can see how broad is the definition of vestis that could be the ob object of a legacy. So in this case, our jurist is thinking of, uh, for instance, a will in which the testator has left um, garments to uh, his wife. And um, when uh, the, te the will, the testament is opened and the wife uh, starts to look for the garments included in the legacy, um, discovers uh, that uh, there is a piece of cloth on, on the loom. So uh, the problem is, is this piece of cloth on the loom uh, due to be considered part of the legacy? Um, and the answer of the jurist is, it depends. It depends on what? It depends uh, on the um, stage of weaving uh, the cloth um, is, um, is at. So if the cloth is totally, completely woven, um, even if it hasn't been uh, detached from the uh, loom, that could be considered um, um, vestimentum or vestis as an object of the legacy. And maybe uh, again, in, in this case, um, to better understand the ratio decidendi, it means the reason why the jurist is telling us this, um, it would be uh, useful to ask for some more information. Um, uh, the uh, antiquity scholars, mm, and of course, uh, this fragment uh, requires the study of, uh, of the looms. And um, the conclusion is that uh, since we are in the third century, um, after Christ, uh, probably uh, the jurist is talking about a double beam uh, loom, not a warp weighted loom, unless uh, the uh, piece of cloth is made of uh, linen. But of course, um, just these pieces of information um, can't be uh, known by Roman law scholars. Um, unless they read the works of the archaeologists and the historians. And then, um, okay, um, there is a text that is very interesting because um, it tells us um, the material of the uh, vestimenta and the way they were worn. And um, it's interesting for us jurists uh, to note that picture and clavi were part of the um, dress, even if they weren't uh, sewn as it, as it is said in this other passage. And um, this is really difficult for us to, um, to understand because um, 
maybe uh, some um, antiquity scholars who knew how um, togas and tunics uh, were made could uh, explain uh, how the purple stripes uh, could not be uh, sewn um, in, in, um, uh, in, a, in a dress. And um, there is also another passage. Um, I'm talking about examples here because there are a lot of texts um, in which Alpian, again, um, gives us a sort of um, categorization of uh, the garments as um, garments that are um, especially uh, intended for the use of men, women, children, or common to both sexes and the ones used by slaves. And um, this text um, could also uh, help us to um, understand uh, a problematic case in which the testator has left uh, to somebody uh, as a legacy um, uh, all his male uh, garments, but um, after the opening uh, of the testament, they, um, well, let's see the, the legacy uh, and the heir uh, found uh, a garment that um, is also uh, um, suitable for women. And so the problem is uh, whether this um, dress um, belongs to the legacy. Um, so uh, since I have no more time, and again, I apologize for uh, talking uh, so long, I, I stop here. <laughs>